All right, hello and welcome to Monday. Let's get rid of all this. Monday, the, uh, what is it, the 23rd. And so it's start a business Q&A. Thanks so much for everyone who joined and watches this. And uh, I think, I hope you got had a great weekend. There's been a lot of things I've been planning. Um, so I'm excited about uh, some of the things happening in the next couple of months. So firstly, Edinburgh University, big shout out. Uh, thank you very much for asking me to come up and speak to your entrepreneurial society. I think there's 400 of you in that society, so I hope to be a good turnout. Also San Francisco uh, in a few months time. Those of you who are in that general direction, um, I'm gonna hopefully be doing a day's event, so I'll have uh, a load of people um, who are friends in the local area who can also speak prosperly, but it'll be me uh, chatting to a few people. So if you're in San Francisco, I'll release a date, probably mid to late uh, April, we'll be having a, a, um, a seminar kind of day there, so it'll be quite nice to to meet a lot of you face to face. Thanks so much um, for everyone's uh, kind thoughts on that already. So let's do the Q and A. So we've got probably uh, six or seven questions here and thanks very much for everyone who's pinged them over in the last couple of days. It's been great to get questions from you. Um, let's start off with uh, Brett Canfield. So he wrote to me, um, how do you minimize consumption of the digital world such as Facebook, YouTube, podcast, Twitter and etc., to focus on your production? It's a really good question. It's really topical given that right now we are in a, well not right now, we've been for a while in fact, in a kind of world where a lot of people are spending their time online and they're trying to build a business online. And the problem is that, the, well, the reason why online is so compelling is so many people make use of it. And the reason why people make use of it is because there's so many great things to look at. And that's inherently the issue. So, you know, building an, a, a, a Facebook fan page is very difficult because you're right in the middle of that very world that's so interesting. You're constantly looking at, you know, news feeds and things like that. Likewise, YouTube channels, trying to build a YouTube channel without looking at loads of other YouTube videos is really difficult to do because they're there to distract you, right? So this is the same as many things. Uh, William, thanks so much for joining in. Hello there, good morning to you. This is the same as many things. It's about habit, okay? And I would say um, I'm very uh, good at being resilient to um, the kind of the hype things that pop up all the time to say, you know, come and look at me, come and look at my video, or come and look at this cool thing. It's a cat playing a xylophone, or whatever. It used to be the case that you, when you're exposed to this kind of thing for the first time, you're so into it and you're like, oh, I just can't, I want to look, check these things out. And you while away the hours. Um, and my resilience to that has taken a lot of time to build up because it's a habitual thing, right? So you tend to find that you get better at things if you practice it. And I have a post-it note, you can't see it off, it's off screen here. There's a post-it note I've had for many, many uh, um, months, probably about a year or so now, that I have on the side of my desk and it's the word nope, N-O-P-E. And so whenever I, I, I put it up there because whenever I was on YouTube or Facebook or something like that, I found I would get a little bit distracted. I'd think, oh, that's quite cool. I'll just check this. I'll just watch this. <laughs> I'll just watch that video. Then I'll go on to watch this one. Then I'll, then I'll produce my video. But what you do is you end up spending an hour doing it. So whenever I um, found something that was looking like it might distract me, I'd look at the post-it note and it was nope. And I wrote that note after having a word with myself and saying, Every time you get distracted, it's more time you're using that you could be using on building yourself up. And if you choose, because it is a choice, if you choose to use up your time looking at Facebook and YouTube and things uh, within those things that will distract you as opposed to will be constructive for your production, then you can't complain about not having enough time. You can't do it because it is a choice. But like with anything that is possibly a marginal, almost, um, you know, I suppose almost a, uh, a bit of an addiction, you have to to ease yourself off it. It's hard to go cold turkey and not look at anything at all. So what I would do, just to answer this question, how do you minimize consumption of it? You simply, what you do is stay off it. And, and what I did to start with was say, I'm not gonna use YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, unless it is specifically with the purpose of uploading something for my business. And I tended to find that, I went through about three or four weeks of doing this, and so I only allowed myself onto it when I was about to post something. And 
I was just checking in, like with Facebook, check in. Okay, you've got five messages in the last uh, three hours. Check these things out. Is there anything of interest? Now kill it, turn it off and carry on to the next thing. And it's an idea I had because it came it came about, about, it was about 13, 14 years ago uh, when I was selling an, um, online marketing. So this is, you know, like 2003 or something like that. I remember at that time I had a screen on my desk with the internet and this was a big deal because back then it was like, oh, we've got the internet now, this is nice. And um, I was selling all my marketing, but I had paper leads. I had people's, you know, managing directors' phone numbers written down and the reason why they should join our website and advertise. And what I did was I turned the screen off and so basically it was from this idea that you only use the screen when you need the screen. So I never had that kind of, oh, I'll check what's going on on the internet. It was a case of just work, focus on the leads, dial the numbers. When someone picks up, now I'll turn on my screen with my website ready to sell and I'll carry on. If there's no one, um, you know, if that call is finished now, I'll turn it off and I'll carry on with, with just dialing. And it worked really well because it, means, it meant that there was nothing to distract me because it wasn't in my eyesight. So it's something worth thinking about, uh, and I think um, it is one of the things you've got to get used to doing. So YouTube now, I allow myself to view. I allow myself to look at videos on YouTube that might not be directly related to my business. I'm allowed to to indulge because I know that I can trust myself to not watch too much. And what I do is I assign watching a bit of YouTube, say, uh, you know, two two videos from my favorite subscribers and that uh, subscriptions and that would be you know 15 minutes worth and you get that as a reward for closing a deal that morning or you get that as a reward for you know landing a new piece of business in some way or if i've done all of my reports for my clients then you know then you listen to a piece of music or you you know you you check the latest in twitter or something like that but i did find that um over time, the more I was um, exposing myself to social media in order to drive my businesses, the less I was really interested in the kind of flotsam and jetsam in there. That's kind of, okay, this is just like some people just posting out what they're doing. And I was seeing these social media sites as more of a tool instead. And um, really, it was the case that me personally personally using things like Facebook, it wasn't really of interest anymore um, because I was, I was seeing the sites as, as a, something which is, as I say, a bit more of a tool instead. So it takes time. You have to kind of work on it and make it a bit of a habit, I would say. So uh, Brett, thanks so much. It's a really good question. And as I say, very, very topical. Uh, Matthias Hahn, you actually wrote two questions. I'm going to do one first. Um, he's asked, um, what would you do if you had an employee with a permanent contract, so he's working for you, that is off uh, off on sick leave and it seems obvious that he or she is using the sick leave to take a few days off and there's no proof for it okay so um, i've actually had this before i remember once uh, running a team when i was selling um conferences and there was a there was one guy who um coincidentally always used up exactly every day of his holiday which is fine you're allowed to and he also used up every one of the eight statutory days of sick leave so here in the uk for instance you're allowed to be ill or sick or off work sick if you're a permanent <coughs> excuse me a permanent employee for um, eight days of the year. So in eight days of the year, you're allowed to be sick and you will get paid. That's just your rights as, an, as a permanent employee and typically after probation you get that. This person coincidentally every year always took exactly eight days sick leave. And basically what he was doing, it was obvious, was he was having his holiday, which was like 22 days. Then he would add the eight days sick and he would be thinking, I've got 30 days off in the year. And I'll happen to be sick only ever uh, to bookend the holiday days he was having off. Now, the thing is, and I think, I think the reason why Matthias is asking this is because gone are the days where you can say, it's obvious what you're doing, get out. Because it doesn't work like that. People have rights and his HR and things like that. And I think the reason probably why Matthias has added that uh, this is a permanent contract, it makes the point that um, if you've got no proof and they're an employee, well, they're entitled to take those that time off. Look, the bottom line is this. This person you identified, you believe, um, isn't putting their their kind of their heart and soul into the job and the fact is that not everyone always will um it's possible that if someone is always trying to use up all their sick days and and using it for 
excuse me, for time out, they're possibly also the kind of people that in other areas of their business are also not pulling their weight. Maybe they always leave it at half past five. Again, contractually, they're allowed to do that. But I suppose the underlining issue here is this is possibly someone who never really pulls their weight and does everything. Look, if you feel that you've got someone who's a decent worker and they're doing what they're meant to be doing, well, what's your problem? Let them let them have their sick days, you know, because the thing is, if you, if you call them out on it, they're only going to deny it. And then you end up with a frosty issue uh, in, in your, you know, in your business. So we're talking here about the fact that if someone is trying to really push the boundaries and work to only the limit, you know, working to the limits of what's possible with your with your company rules, you need to look at other ways to manage them into working harder. Maybe it's an opportunity for you to look at yourself and say, why is it that this person doesn't feel compelled to throw themselves at this job? What could I do to maybe improve it for them? Maybe they have some real skills if you reassign them. And I've reassigned people in the past in my teams from one role to another and suddenly they've thrived because actually it was better for them that way. You tend to find then people like to take a little less holiday. Not that that's a good thing necessarily, but they are less interested or inclined to, you know, to just be looking for an exit all the time because actually they're quite enjoying the role. But bottom line is this, if you need, if someone is not quite right for the role uh, and they're not, giving it the heart and soul and that's really what you need. You need to have a, um, a frank word with them. But what you can't do is say, I you know, accuse them of doing something which, which you have no proof for. So ultimately it's about performance management. If you want everyone to do a work at a certain level, you need to specify that and then work them through a process. So you can PM me if you want some more questions, uh, answer more questions on that. Hopefully that, that helps a bit. Latanya, thanks very much for joining. It's good to hear you, uh, see you on here. So um, next question is from Lexter King. Thank you very much. Uh, Lex, I think you're new into orbit around here. So it's nice to see a question from you. How best can I learn about business and being a professional business person and a leader without going to business school, B school, as some people call it? So say it again, so how, how can best I learn about business and being a professional business person and a leader without going to business school? I didn't go to business school. And um, whilst I don't profess to know everything, uh, people trust me with huge amounts of money every every month to you know they pay me as a consultant to show them how to run their businesses and we're, I've, we've delivered some great results and here's the thing both my degrees were in history okay so I I, I, I have uh, degrees that arguably have no link whatsoever to the business world um, what the degrees taught me were different flavors and, and um, uh, formulas and ways of working and methods that are arguably transferable. But the reality is the reason why I have done very well in building my businesses and helping others and teaching people how to lead, for instance, and sell and whatnot is experience. So to answer this question, uh, it's clear that the best way, the best way, in my opinion, to learn because you're not asking for the most efficient way, but the best way, in my opinion, is to go out there and do it and actually experiment. So there are three things you could do here without, because the, the caveat is without going to business school. So if you go to business school, it doesn't guarantee any level of success. It just means you're understanding the theory more. But the three things I would suggest are, are A, go work in a job where you're exposed to things you want to be exposed to. So for instance, my first job required me to learn how to sell cold calling managing directors around the world. And I learned vast amounts from that. It was, it's without a doubt, one of the most important skills I have in business. Um, in addition, I would suggest you also learn. So if you're not going to business school, go teach yourself. And so it was only, I reckon it was probably eight or nine months into my job. So I was in my very early 20s. And, and instead of saying, oh, I'm done, it's Friday evening, that's it till Monday when I'd finish my school, my, my, sorry, my work at, at, at uh, uh, you know, my, my end of the day, I would use my commission and I would pay for seminars and conferences and I'd go at weekends and learn how to be better. I'd go on a negotiation course or something like that. Um, I would spend my money on books that could teach me. 
and you know learning is actually a really clever way of, of kind of being basically I was being self-taught I was I was just thinking well, why don't I go and let, buy this book it's 10 pounds if I buy this book it will teach me how to do this maybe a little bit better and investing in myself was a very good way of learning so you don't have to spend money to go to university to go and learn um, arguably the way people teach at university and the credentials they have and the experience and the authority goes a long way to uh, giving you better quality of learning but um, it leads me on to the the arguably the best way of learning which is actually just to do it yourself not just working for a, as an employee but actually go build your own business yourself because when you're an employee okay Depending on your manager and your environment, you tend to find that you, you, you do get onto the front line, you're in the trenches and all that, and you're making the calls and things, but there is a security blanket there. And what I mean is, at the end of the day, you get paid your salary, and you've got the security, typically, of a business that probably is more robust than if you did it on your own okay so a business will probably be there the next month there's probably enough money coming in from people who are more experienced than you to support the fact that you might not be very good at what you're doing but ultimately the best way of learning is to go and build your own business because what and, and I mean fully without any kind of uh, there's nothing wrong with building a business and if you've also got a nine-to-five there's nothing wrong with doing these things part-time as well but I know firsthand that when you move from a employee status, so working for someone else, being paid a salary for showing up and so on, when you move to a space where you now are in charge of everything, what it means is that suddenly everything gets very real, okay? So you start saying to yourself things like, right, there is zero income in the next month. If I have my mortgage to pay for, nappies to pay for if I've got a child, if I have to maybe pay for a car or whatever it is, all of that money has to come from somewhere. Suddenly you get very real. You start realizing that a lot of the things you thought you might need to do in business actually don't matter that much. And so to learn the real fundamentals of business, like the black and white stuff, the, you know, the binary things, it's like, when you have nothing, you create that hunger and you say to yourself, actually, if I want to make myself some money, then I need to go and find someone that can give me money. And in order to get money from them, I have to have product or I have to have a service. And if I don't have that, that means I need to make that now. You become tremendously logical about things. And what you realize is that if you, if you have a product and you're trying to sell it to people, and you're getting no response, well, you need to really change quickly because you're not gonna get paid a salary at the end of the month. You're gonna get paid nothing. So now you have to change it. Now I have to affect what I'm doing here. I need to change this, I need to change that. And you just go for the, the shortest route between A and B. Over time, you start embellishing your business, but learning that the sharp end is essentially what you need to do, that's really what helps. And there's an additional here about how do I learn about being professional well, you learn because some people don't respond to you if you're not res you're, you're not professional. And then some people uh, will start giving you feedback. And, you, and, in, and the feedback may not be in words. It may be in a lack of sales. And so what you do is you say, well, you say to yourself, well, that person didn't like it when I spoke to them in that way or I came across in that way. Or they gave me, as you could sense, they didn't really you know, really connect with me. Maybe I, need, I should work on looking a little bit different or coming across in a different way. So you study people and basically being thrust into that sink or swim environment is an excellent way, an excellent way of getting yourself uh, learning, you know, with a vertical learning curve, really. And finally, in terms of learning to be a leader, it's the same principle, you know, you can learn by becoming a leader. After about 18 months uh, in my first job, they made me a manager and they gave me a few people to start looking after after and I crashed and burned to start with I was like I don't really know what I'm doing and there was a period when I just sat back I was like so I seem to be the boss go do your work and it didn't work and I learned actually that it was better to lead from the front rather than whip from the back and actually get stuck in and being a leader is really just being a really good employee I found um, 
and then you know you could learn of course there's books and courses i went on leadership courses i went i think it was about a week i paid for uh for a leadership course and that was quite handy gave me some good theory that i might learn at business school and of course then when you run your own teams it's you know again it's the case of right well now i'm paying you guys you either make nothing or you make you at least kind of pay to keep the lights on. So I need to make sure that um, you're doing well. So what do you do as a leader? You invest in people. You, you, it's like I need you. To, I need to, you guys to make money to make sure this business works, or to contribute in whatever way I, I I was looking for you to contribute when I hired you. So you start putting it, putting in more energy and effort to make sure they do well. It's all logical stuff. So people overthink this kind of thing, but the best way to, to learn, I think, about business is to build one of your own. doesn't mean you have to, but I think it's a, it was the best way for me because, as I say, suddenly everything was real. I needed to know how to have a website built. I tried, I learned the basics, then I got someone to do it for me. I had to learn the essentials of how accounting works and cash flow and profit and loss, and I learned a lot of that from being an employee. But then it becomes very real when it's your own money and then you get an accountant, but even then you need to kind of understand it, otherwise it's like, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're saying. So you need to you need to kind of learn as you go, but you do find, you do find that when you don't have any safety nets, you know, you don't really have any savings, you don't really have any, you don't have a part-time job to fall back on, that, that actually the, the most important things kind of surface and they make themselves very obvious. Right now, I need some cash, so I need to go make that. Right now, how pretty the spreadsheet looks to house all of my clients when I get them, who cares? It just doesn't matter right now because we're gonna be broke at the end of the month unless I drum up some sales. You know, those kind of things come into your mind. So hope that helps. It's a really good question, Lex the King. Thanks so much for pinging those, uh, that over. A uh, question here for, from uh, Matt Baisley. If you would go back, if you could go back, what advice would you give yourself as you set out in the world of business? Okay, uh, this one's asked all the time, almost every week, to the point where I sometimes omit it because it's just like, am I saying the same thing? I would say, um, you know, there's a few things. Firstly, focus on customer acquisition as fast as possible. And what that does, okay, what that does is it makes you realize what things are important. So if I want to acquire a customer, and I'm literally starting my business today, and I have no product or service, what's the obvious thing you need? You need your product or service. So customer acquisition is the number one thing, because customer acquisition creates loyalty, testimonials, cash flow, uh, repeat business, advocates and, and you know saying that someone else should buy again, maybe they buy something bigger next, all this kind of stuff. A, a customer acquisition sell, solves a lot of problems. It offsets the fact that you will have entropy. So your existing customers over time will fall away for whatever reason. It's not your fault, sometimes they go. So you need to always have customer acquisition in mind literally every day is the number one piece of advice. So like I say, you don't have a product yet if it's day one, so go get a product or service. And that's where the MVP, Minimum Viable Product, comes from. This is the 8stepstartup.com course, kind of in, in three minutes, if you like. So the idea is get that product, get the product, because if you can have something minimum, and in fact, for, for me, some of my products I, I've sold, so I've received money from them, and I've not even built them yet. It's like, if you, I tell you what, you can buy it for a third of the price now, so I can get some capital coming in while I'm building the product, and of course then you'll be the first people to get hold of it when it comes out. When it comes out, of course, it'll be three times the, the, the price, and so of course that's how you can drum up some sales. So customer acquisition is crucial, because when you get customers, you can then speak to them, so, sell them more things, and share, and get them to share as well. It's, it's a important otherwise you're on your own making no money the other thing is you've got to be consistent i and people ask me someone asked me um at the weekend actually because i i'm i have to say i i'm blown away because i hit twenty five thousand followers on instagram on the.richard.more now for many that's not a lot okay but 
I ran that Instagram account probably about 18 months, that's all. And I, it, was, it was there just to kind of try things out and see how it, you know, try different kind of approaches. But 25,000 people liking that account uh, and, and following it and, and, you know, I've won loads of business through that. I've had loads of great opportunities. The, the, the um, presentation I plan to do in Edinburgh University soon has come out of the back of Instagram. Um, some of my best partnerships have come from Instagram as well. But someone asked me, you know, how do you get that, that many followers and um, it was actually really simple I was just consistent I consistently provided value to people like me I identified that um, if I would be at my most natural state when I'm speaking to people like me and what happens if you are yourself and target people like yourself you tend to target people really well because you know what you like and you're an authority on what you like and as a result the people who are like you tend to like your stuff and it's kind of obvious right so I what I did was I, I, I always had this idea of doing posts on Instagram uh, for people like me you know if I was looking at Instagram what would be of interest so that you know the images are obviously crucial but the captions are, are really the detail that's my view on things and my opinion and whatever and 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 it is a case of always being there every day literally never missed a day on on Instagram and <clears throat> excuse me it's the same really with um with Facebook as well, it's all of this kind of thing. It's just being consistent. Every day you should be looking for a new customer. Every day you should be looking to make sure you, if you're doing social media, do social media. Um, I said to one of my clients recently who's writing a book, um, I said, you know, if you're gonna write a book, then literally you have to do it every day. You have to make this a habit. So, you know, touch base with your book every day. If you're not feeling inspired, everyone goes, oh, but I got writer's block, fine. Read the book. Just read what you've written so far. Every day, you just got to have a touch point with it. Make sure, even if it's 10 minutes, reading the first page and then nothing else. Because what happens is some days you're on it and some days you're not. But at least you're getting the habit of, of being there. So consistency as well. Customer acquisition and consistency. If you can nail those two things, I would say that, that's, that's my kind of advice to focus on those things uh, as you start out in the world of business, as you said, Matt. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, another one here from Matthias Hahn. What's your opinion? What, in your opinion, are the differences between Simon Sinek's "Leaders Eat Last" and first, first ask why"? So these are two books I actually um, I really rate Simon Sinek. If you haven't seen his uh, TED talk, I'll just talk about now. If you haven't seen his TED talk on the Golden Circle, it's something like 29 million views. It's insane. It's amazing. But it's also really the reason why it's so valuable. And it talks about the the what, the how, and then the why in this kind of these three circles. And the the idea is that most employees know what they sell. Okay, they should. <laughs> Then the second thing is a, a decent amount of those employees know how to sell it. They know what they're selling and how to sell it. But an infinitesimally small amount of people actually know why they sell it. And what he suggests, and this is the book, Start with First Ask Why, is you should start, and this is a really good advice for anyone starting out a business or anyone who has, just to check with themselves. You should start with, why am I actually doing this? So you need to make sure it's that mission. And people say, you know, what's your why? And it's a reference to this. You need to make sure that the reason why you're doing something is compelling. It's not how you go about doing it or what you're gonna sell. It's about why you really feel it's important. Because when you have a good why, so you have a good mission, and it might be that, you know, your, your, your business is, I, my why is, I have to make sure that I um, feed my family. Or my why is that I need to make sure that I'm better than everyone else I know. It could be that, it could be completely selfless. That might be the kind of person you are and no one can take that away from you. And you don't need, when it comes down to the why, you can make that private. You know, you don't need to feel like it has to be a noble why. It doesn't have to be. My why and my mission is that I want to make sure I, I help people and save the world. You know, I look at Bill Gates spending all of his money and, and his foundation to help solve uh, diseases like, uh, you know, malaria and things like that. You know, it doesn't have to be that unless you have that compulsion. But the whole point is if you get the right kind of why, you move to this place where you feel compelled to do it. 
um, my whys, there's actually more than one, one kind of why in there. There's a number of things that I keep private, but one of them is I really enjoy building businesses. I find it really stimulating. And um, after, if you read my Huffington Post article you'll, uh, through Instagram, you can see the link for it. One of the things that came out of having a, a different past life when I worked uh, a decade in London, I was doing 80 hour weeks and earning wonderful money but having no life whatsoever one of my whys was that I've, I've got to get a job or make a world where I can really um, do the things I want to do because I'm here for this short amount of time I'm only capable for an even lesser amount of time because I might be old and decrepit or a young baby you know I need to make the most of what I've actually got and if you get that right then it means that you have no problem ever with staying up late if you have to, with getting up early, with going, th like running through walls. And I remember that, that question a little earlier about someone who always is taking sick leave and using up on their holiday and leaving at work early. You never do that unless you've earned it, but you never do it, you know, when you need to have, uh, you know, when you need to step up and work because your why is right. But then it's easy, you know, if you like, I, I'm like, with every part of my soul, I have to achieve this why, you end up finding, you're like, it's like, okay, so, what, so how am I going to do it? I need to do this, okay? And what is it that we're going to actually sell? Just do it this way. It's really straightforward then. Um, but the why is the crucial thing. If you look at the other book, Leaders Eat Last, it's this idea of real leaders being the people who put their team last, uh, put their team first even, put themselves last. And um, I learned the hard way by having pressure from above when I was managing a, t a sales team, a very, very start, um, and pressure from below because I had man a manager saying, we need you to hit these targets and my team not wanting to, to stick up, you know, st stick in the work and really go for it. And I found that um, the more I gave, you know, and to use the words of Gary Vaynerchuk, you should be your team's bitch. Seriously, as a manager, you should be their bitch. And people think they're the big boss and the big man. Good for you. But you tend to find you'll get better results by being the, um, you know, by being the person who really helps the team more. And there was a, a manager I once worked with. He's a really successful guy. I really respect many things he does. Um, and he once said, you know, heavy hangs the head who wears the crown. Um, but he said, but also it's the people who put the crown on your head. So there's two points really important. Heavy hangs the head, it, what he means, you've got a heck of a lot of work to do as a leader, but also what he said was, you know, it's the people underneath you who, uh, who put the crown on your head. You don't put it on. So that means you don't swag around saying, I'm the big boss man. What you do is you have your people say, you are totally our leader. You inspire us, you are great, you, you make us the best we are. And leaders eat and last, the idea being, being that you make sure everyone's looked after and doing great. And when you do that, you tend to find that there's spoils for you. So the more you help people, basically, the more you help out and, and give, uh, the more you get in return. If you have not read Give and Take by uh, Professor Adam Grant, you are missing a major part of understanding leadership, but also other facets of business as well. So he's a professor at Wharton University. He's uh, won awards for being one of the most effective um, uh, professors under the age of 30 or something like that I believe it was and he very kindly contributed to my 8stepstartup.com course so those of you on it uh, you get, you're getting great insight from it but you must read really give, give and take to really explain, get this explained well um, so the answer the question here is in what in your opinion the differences between them well they're really different books you know um, Leaders Eat Last is a book about how to be an effective leader and understanding the ethos of the giving culture and it's just that thing that most people want instant gratification and it's the same with trying to uh, sell a client as well. What you need to do is understand that if you play the long profit game, help first, get sale later, it's more effective. You get more buy-in, more loyalty, higher deal value. I've proven it with the teams I've coached as well. It's much more effective to work that way around. And of course, First Ask Why is more of a call to arms to employees as well as leaders as well. But the idea is it's focused on people understanding why they're actually doing something and if you don't have a real kind of a, a strong why about the business you're working in you shouldn't be doing the job or at least you should stop momentarily and think well why actually am I doing this if you can understand 
why you're you're using the best hours of your day typically if it's nine to five to work on something why you're actually doing it and saying because i need to pay the rent is absurd you've been you've got a gift of being able to do anything you really want to if you say to yourself look i I have this real need to go and achieve X, then you need to make sure that you're doing things that will help you uh, go on the steps towards that. And there's someone I, I was in t- touch with last week, uh, she wants to be a singer, and she's, she's doing an MLM thing at the moment, she's selling this uh, you know, health water, Plexus I think it is, and she's, um, but she wants to be a singer. So it's like, so, so how is the sale of water helping you become a singer? It's not. Maybe one day when I'm making loads of money, I can do it. Well, why don't you just go be a singer now? So her her why wasn't really aligned. And her why was, was much more like, like the stimulation she gets. She feels good. She feels like her best version of herself when she sings. Uh, she's always told that she's a great singer. So her why is all in there. And once she's unraveled that, she's like, well, all I need to know is how am I going to do it? I know what I'm doing. It's just singing. But how am I going to do it? Right. Well, let's start singing on YouTube. Let's start singing live on Facebook every day so people can hear me. Let's book in some uh, uh, venues and start singing there and get people involved. You know, that's the idea. And she, she, you know, this kind of person you could, I remember her saying, you know, I'm I'm absolutely buzzing now. I can't wait to get started. It's like, well, that's how you should feel about whatever it is you do each day. And some people think, oh, yeah, as if you would about your job, though. Well, then you're in the wrong job or you've not you've not um, attributed the reason why, you know, you you should be doing this job to your outcome. OK, and if your outcome is your why, then it makes sense. So that's kind of the, the short version of those books. And they are quite different, I suppose. Uh, let's finish with one more question. Thank again. Thank you again for anyone who's uh, chimed in here. If you have any questions about your startup business or, or general startup business questions, you can write them in the comments right now. I'll probably just see if I can answer one more, though. OK, so uh, Dario Heschel, could it be that zero to one the Zero to One book, this is the book by Peter Thiel. If you haven't read it, another good book worth reading. It, this is a guy who was involved with PayPal and um, an investor in, in some really important businesses as well. Uh, could it be that Zero to One book for some people is too advanced to understand? I had no idea that he what he was saying for the most part. Okay, well look, yeah, it could be. It depends on you and your, your reading ability and things like that. But it also could be that it doesn't make sense because it's not really something that's tuned into your world. It might not be necessary for you. I mean, the number of people, I've got it up here, where is it? Uh, There, The Intelligent Investor by Ben Graham, who was the mentor for Warren Buffett. It's a classic example of a book. By the way, I've read it, okay? And I've read it because I actually invest money. I invest, I buy and own currently stocks in in different companies, okay? So I, I trade casually uh, and things like that. Now, the reason why people buy it a lot of the time, I've seen, is for posing. Because if they hold the book and take a picture, it makes them look really intelligent, right? When you kind of read it, it's actually, you know what? It's not the book I would recommend for investing. Honestly, I recognize that he is uh, Warren Buffett's mentor. I get it. But it's not the one I would recognize for I would recommend for investing with a caveat. Firstly, if you are starting out as an investor, if you're starting out, sure, it's worth having a glance over, but you'll find it's quite dry and hard to work through. The content's really like, okay. A lot of it you need to stop every two minutes and look up stuff as well. If you're if you're a full time trader and you actually you know if you run a hedge fund or work for one or if you're a trader in in another capacity, it's probably a great book to read. Okay, but what you find is that you know if you read the long or short of it, which is actually uh, just next to this John K book, this this um, pink one. It's brilliant. It's really accessible and it's designed for people who are you know investing in their spare time it's really simple to understand it's designed to be in you know it's investing for intelligent people but it doesn't have to be it's not well, it's just not really super bogged down like the intelligent investor is but here's the thing a lot of people read it because they feel they're meant to read it well everyone else is reading it right so shouldn't i no you shouldn't it's like me reading a book on real estate i have property but i don't do real estate as part of my businesses. In the future, I plan to probably do that. But right now, I don't need it. So 
why would you read a book when you don't need it? And if you are reading books, you've got to be selective. Yes, go to the top, so read the best books on your topic, but also read ones that are accessible. And the Benjamin Graham's book, The Intelligent Investor, is an example of a book that is great for if you're an investor and also bad if you're an investor. It's great if you're an investor who probably has a fair idea of what they're doing. It's bad if you're someone who wants to become an investor. As your first read, you'll find it and be like, what the hell is this about? It'll turn you off, you wanna, you, you wanna do it. Go get a simple book on investing first, really important there. So zero to one's exactly the same thing. Understanding that the guy is big on technology, that there's a difference between doing kind of the same as other people, zero, or one, doing, you know, something that's quite unique and different in innovation and creativity with with technology obviously is his thing and um if you don't understand it it's possibly because the book doesn't resonate with what you're doing right now or maybe the book's too high end for you so start lower down it doesn't mean i mean look if you're trying to access that kind of world if you're trying to understand the importance behind being innovative and creative uh in 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 launching something you should probably start with something more simplistic go read purple cow by um seth godin then read zero to one then zero to one will make a lot more sense then the purple cow is like here's what's important being really good is risky it's dangerous you shouldn't try and be really good you need to be either really bad because <laughs> you've muck mucked it up or epically good okay sitting in the middle is not a good idea and so what he's suggesting is this call to arms of just going going to the next level being someone unique or something better and that then feeds into the zero to one uh, ethos a bit more but you need to make sure you're you're really understanding that some books are too difficult to understand because they're too difficult to understand maybe you need to build up to them or maybe you just maybe it's not your space and like I say, just be careful. A lot of people read things like The Intelligent Investor because they think they should. Maybe they follow Ty Lopez and, oh, he read it, so I should too, right? Or they think, oh, well, Warren Buffett is, is one of the richest people in the world, so should I, surely I should read the book written by his mentor. No. If you do investing, maybe you should, as I've said. But if you are, uh, you know, if you are doing Amazon sales, you know, the uh, if you're doing... Uh, you're trying to use, uh, you're doing e-commerce, you Shopify and Amazon selling t-shirts or whatever. Why the hell are you reading The Intelligent Investor? It's a waste of your time, a waste of your time, because it may look good, but you're not going to be able to apply half of the stuff you're learning. Okay, so all of this stuff's useful. All of these different amazing books written by the top people are useful, but at the right time. OK, either build up to them if that's your space or don't read them until it becomes your space. You see what I mean? There's a lot of amazing books I haven't read because that's not relevant to the world I'm in right now. You have any, only so much time a day, and within that time each day, you only have so many, so many, so much time that you're gonna apportion to reading, right? And if you have that small amount of time, well then be selective. Read stuff that's gonna be helpful to the day you have ahead of you, or the part of your business you're currently working on. And so, with that in mind, be really selective, okay? Don't just read stuff other people read because you think you should or because it looks good. Just think for a moment, what am I putting in my head right now? Am I reading this because I need it? It's applicable. Well, great, go and do it then. But otherwise, you've got to be a little bit more careful. Um, I'm just going to finish there. It's been a, a excellent to... Um, to go through these questions like i said earlier i'm going to be uh, a big shout out to edinburgh university thanks so much for inviting me to, up to do a lecture that will hopefully be in a month or so and san francisco will probably be mid late april i'll go in there and the idea is i'll have a day maybe some friends who are local who can come and do some talks but i'll do a couple of talks myself as well and for those of you out in that way or anyone who wants to come by it'd be a good way to um say hi and meet with some of you but otherwise have a great week thanks so much i hope that was of use uh, if you liked this like the button click on the old like button underneath share it or write a comment if you have any questions watching this after it's recorded live just stick them in and i'll happily get back to you afterwards as well okay so no problem there otherwise thanks so much and follow eightstepstartup.com you'll see a lot more of this kind of information uh answered through the eight step startup course those 73 lessons really were designed to answer these kind of questions that come up okay thanks so much have a massive one monday and a great week and i'll speak to you really soon thursday q a 1 p.m on sales speak to you then